So, Scott Nathaniel, uh, you're now, by now, very well known for Wikipedia art. Could you tell us how it got started? Wikipedia art was launched on February 14, 2009, and the idea behind Wikipedia art was we were looking at the citation mechanism of Wikipedia, which is the basis for Wikipedia articles. Wikipedia's threshold for inclusion is not truth, but verifiability. And we started to see that there were some weird quirks about it, you know, that very often it got propped up as being the place where information was born or a record of information. And there's a paradox there, right? You know, if it's not on Wikipedia, it's not important. Or if it is on Wikipedia, it must be true. Although it's supposed to be a record of information, not a source of information. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at the community behind Wikipedia that was making these articles and making this kind of happen. And so we thought of this idea of making an article called Wikipedia Art that we called art that anyone can edit. And to make this active on Wikipedia, we wanted to have it written about, but it couldn't be written about before it existed. So we contacted several collaborators, we called them, who wrote essays about Wikipedia art before it existed on Wikipedia. Then we placed a page called Wikipedia art, which is quite a long draft explaining this whole concept of citation mechanisms and the fact that Wikipedia was, um, Wikipedia art was going to be performing these citations. And then we sourced those very articles that were also published at the same time on Wikipedia, on the, on the page Wikipedia art, thereby making it a legitimate article. So what we have in this exhibition is what we're really struck with is the kind of mass of commentary and debate and fighting over whether this thing actually exists or not. And we're dealing with the iron irony that the more mass that is generated, the more real it becomes and the more true its existence becomes. So, I mean, in many ways it's gone through all these phases. When it first began, it was almost two artworks at once. On the one hand, it was this beautiful found object that anyone could change just by writing about it. On the other hand, it was a real intervention into the power structures behind Wikipedia. So, within the exhibition, we now have scrolls uh, 30 meters long of debate within various forums and press citations from J journalists around the world in over how many languages? 15. 15 languages around the world 300 and three, so articles. 300 or so journalistic articles and blogs and all manner of things. And of course we have our Ceci n'est pas Wikipedia which was created for us by Patrick Lichty. We have evidence of litigation here so this was a uh, Wikipedia getting in touch saying that Wikipedia art was doing something illegal. And then next door we have uh, remixes, remixes, artist remixes that were made in response to the Wikipedia art movement that then got shown at Transmediale. And if that isn't an endorsement of the artness of something in the media art world, I don't know what it is. This is Nathaniel Stern, who's the artist of Given Time, which is the installation that we're standing in at the moment. And we're standing between two figures who are live, currently and always in Second Life, looking at each other. To me, this piece has always been about um, reciprocity, or in everyday language, love. Uh, the two pieces that most inspired me for the work were uh, an installation by Felix Gonzalez Torres called Untitled Perfect Lovers, where it's two battery operated clocks set to the same time and they slowly fall out of sync and one dies and the other dies. And so, reading um, a book called Given Time about gifting, I started thinking about the, the question that that book posits is around the true gift and how it can only be given when there's really nothing left to give. So I asked, what if we took Untitled Perfect Lovers, a piece about time and the body, and remo removed the body, and we removed time? And, and then there would be truly nothing to give. And so here, all they're giving of is, is one another. And it becomes this forever reciprocal relationship where we see one through the eyes of the other, both in virtual space and in actual space. What's our place between them? I feel like we're kind of interrupting. We're interrupting their gaze, or we're, inter we're stepping into the middle of their relationship somehow. I think um, 
because it's not interactive and because it's quite subtle, I, I like to think of it as being invited into a very potent space of their relationship. And we get to be a part of it and we almost lend our bodies to them since they have none. Um, and so that it, it may indeed be an interruption, but that interruption is what makes it what it is rather than detracting from it. Lovely. So this is Scott Hildor. Uh, he's the artist of, the, who made playing Duchamp for his work and working with recorded games of Marcel Duchamp he's created a virtual player that plays like Marcel Duchamp so we get to play chess with the ghost of Marcel Duchamp. So what I did here was you can go online to uh, playingduchamp.com and start a game and it's just like a standard chess game except what I did was I looked at the way Marcel Duchamp played based on his records of tournament games from the 20s and 30s and reprogrammed uh, the new chess engine to play like Marcel Duchamp. So it actually makes certain moves. So some of the things Marcel Duchamp is known for is being a very aggressive player in the very beginning. He's also known for making mistakes towards the end of the game. He used to get quite tired at the end of chess matches and he'd you know, lose pieces. So it's possible to beat him if you know some of his strategies. One of the things that chess can be thought of is improvised performance. So um, every time you make a chess move, each chess game is, is different. So I kept on thinking about ways to perform the chess game at Furtherfield. And so we came up with the idea, Ruth and I had talked about it for a bit. I think the inspiration was looking at snooker games, which are, are really dreadfully boring if you ever watch them. But the, the announcers are hilarious. They spend a lot of time talking about the players and all this other stuff about the snooker games. So we decided to have um, voiceover announcers explain the chess games. So it has, uh, as with snooker, they have their own jargon and their own language. And what we particularly liked here was that you have the jargon of the art jargon and the chess jargon, and then the beginner's jargon exactly. all kind of coming together. But the hilarious thing is that half the time the people who were doing the commentary didn't actually know how to play chess. And so you had people there talking about what are they doing? Another person trying to explain <laughs> that. Or the two people would go off topic entirely and talk about uh, situationism or some other aspect of art completely. And so I told everyone, you can go off script. You don't have to know how to play chess. And in that way, I wanted to open it up to a larger audience.